Uh, dear professors, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to, to all. Uh, let me begin by thanking most warmly, warmly to the Ferenc Madel Institute of Comparative Law and Central European Academy for their kind invitation to participate at the conference. I also salute and welcome my fellow member, panel members and very much look forward to our later discussion if we have time for such. The subject of my presentation is uh, the protection of property under the European Convention of Human Rights with special regard to Central Europe and ex-Yugoslav republics. In the first part of the presentation, I will address the key points of importance for the understanding of the notion of property possession, the protection of property under the European Convention. I will talk about main elements uh, for the assessment of justified interference with the property rights with special regards to some of the most important cases decided against Central European countries. In the second part of the presentation, I will address some characteristics form of the state interference into property rights with special regard to the case law against ex-Yugoslav Republic. And finally, I will point out the key cases of the European Court in respect, in respect of Central European states, and I will try to come, to come to some kind of conclusion about the protection of property under the European Convention. Uh, first, I would like to say that international protection of property rights represent one of the significant achievements of European protection of human rights. Today, when we look at the statistics and numbers, uh, numbers of the cases decided before the European Court, we could say that the right to property is one of the most important and often protected right in the case law of the Strasbourg Court. Initially, there was no consensus among the member states of the Council of Europe regarding the protection of the right to property. And this right did not find its place in the original text of the Convention. Nevertheless, two years after the adoption of the text of the Convention, Protocol 1 was adopted and the right to property was protected. Article 1 of, property, Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the Convention uh, provides the following. In the first paragraph, it states that every natural uh, or legal person is entitled to the peaceful enjoyment of his possession. The second sentence of the first par paragraph states that no one shall be deprived of his possession except in the public interest and subject to the conditions provided for by law and by the general principle of international law. And in the second paragraph, it states that the, the, the preceding provision shall not, however, in any way impart the right of the state to enforce such laws as it deems necessary to control to control the use of property in accordance with the general interest or to secure the payment of taxes and other contributions or penalties. From this provision, it follows that Article 1 of Protocol 1 does not define property or possession, and then from the reading of the article, there is no answer to the question which property enjoys the protection uh, under the Convention system. The answer to this question can be found in the rich case law of the European Court, which has developed an autonomous meaning of the term possession and property. The autonomous concept of property or possession means that the concept of property, definition and qualification in national legal system do not necessarily correspond with the concept of property or possession in the convention meaning and that the national legislation is not the decisive determinant of whether something is possession or not in the convention system. What is property possession under the European Convention of Human Rights, which property is covered by the European Convention and enjoys the protection before the European Court. First, the Convention protects the existing possession of the person, but also goods and assets, including claims in respect of which the applicant can argue that he or she has at least a legitimate expectation of obtaining effective enjoyment of the property right. By way of contrast, the hope of recognition of the property right, which it has been impossible to exercise effectively, cannot be considered a possession, nor can a conditional claim which lapses as a result of non-fulfillment of the condition. In its case law, especially in the famous case Kopetsky against Slovakia, the European Court analyzed different cases regarding the legitimate expectation and clarify the autonomous meaning and concept and notion of legitimate expectation. The court provided guidelines and criteria for determining notion of legitimate expectation, stating that legitimate ex expectation must be of a nature more concrete than a mere hope and based on a legal provision or legal act such as judicial decision. 
Therefore, uh, property and possession ratione materia, according to Article 1 of Protocol 1, includes the existing property rights over movable and immovable things, other existing rights and economic interest, existing claims and other assets, including real claims and legitimate expectations. In the numerous guides that are dealing with the European Convention and the practice of the, of the Strasbourg Court, in order to determine the scope of the, and the concept of property and possession, uh, various types of ownership and property rights derived from the case law are often mentioned. For example, in intellectual property, copyrights, trademarks, patterns, savings on the bank account, social benefits and pensions are property and possession that enjoys protection under Article 1 of Protocol 1. Also, according to the well-established case law of the European Court, among other things, a claim based on the court decision that has been sufficiently established that can be enforceable is also protected uh, property. On the other hand, uh, the convention uh, on the other hand, the Convention and the European Court does not guarantee or protect the right to acquire property. This situation was often analyzed in the cases, different cases against Central and Eastern European countries, and especially in the context of restitution of property and the conditions for restitutional claim, but also in the context of the different laws that these countries adopted before the ratification of the Convention. In the case in these cases, the court analyzed admissibility criteria, different aspects of the scope of the right to property, and also compatibility, ratione temporis, and ratione materia. For example, in the case Jantner against Slovakia, the applicant's restitution claim was dismissed as the national courts found that he had not established his permanent residence in Slovakia, which was a condition prescribed under the Law Land Ownership Act in 1991 for a restitutional claim. The finding of the national courts was contested by the applicant who considered that he had met all the statutory requirements for the restitutional claim to be granted. The European Court held that under the relevant national law, as interpreted and implied by the domestic authorities, the applicant had neither a right nor a claim amounting to legitimate expectation within the meaning of the court's case law to obtain restitution of the property in question. In Jantner, the courts emphasized that Article 1 of Protocol 1 cannot be interpreted as imposing any general obligation on the contract, contracting states to restore property which was transferred to them before they ratified the, the Convention. Nor does Article 1 of Protocol 1 impose any restriction on the contracting states' freedom to determine the scope of property restitution and to choose the conditions under which they agree to restore property rights to the former owners. In the similar Grand Chamber case, Granzinger and Granzinger against Czech Republic, the applicants, US citizens, who previously had citizenship of Czechoslovak Republic after their rehabilitation under the Extrajudicial, Extrajudicial Rehabilitation Act, made a request for the return of their property rights that they had before leaving the United States. The national courts dismissed their claim, noting that they had not satisfied one of the requirements laid down in the, in the relevant national law, namely Czech nationality, and were therefore not entitled to apply to recover the property. The applicants complained before the European court that they were unable to recover their former property on the grounds that they, that they no longer had Czech nationality, in spite of the fact that the decision to confiscate the property had been quashed with retrospective effect. In deciding whether the applicants have not shown, uh, have not shown that they had, a, so, sorry, in deciding whether the applicants had possession with the meaning of Article 1, Protocol 1, the court concluded that the applicants, applicants have not shown that they had uh, a claim that was sufficiently established to be enforceable, and they therefore cannot argue that they had a possession within the meaning of Article 1, Protocol 1. Consequently, neither the judgments of the national courts nor the interference of the peaceful enjoyment of possession and the fact of the case do not fall to be examined under Article 1, Protocol 1. In their famous pilot judgment, Braniowski against Poland, the applicant alleged the breach of Article 1, Protocol 1 to the European Convention. It that his entitlement to compensation for property abandoned had not been satisfied. In this very important uh, judgment of the court, the court, the court emphasized that once a contracting state, having ratified the convention, including Protocol 1, uh, enact legislation, 
uh, providing for the full or partial restoration of property confiscated under a previous regime, such legis legislation may be regarded as generating a new property right protected by Article 1 of Protocol 1 for persons satisfying the, the requirements for entitlement. The same may apply in respect of arrangements for restitution or compensation established under pre-ratification legislation if such legislation remained at force after the contracting states had stratified the Protocol 1. So from these examples, from the case law of the court, we can see the scope of the, of the protection of property and also compatibility ratione materia and ratione temporis. Now I want to say a few things about state uh, positive and negative obligation under Article 1 of Protocol 1. When we look at the Article 1, uh, this uh, Protocol 1, these uh, provisions primarily provide protection from the various forms of unjustified interference of the state. Unjustified interference with the enjoyment of the property rights is considered a negative obligation and of the state and usually is a consequence of some specific actions undertaken by the executive authorities of the member states. Also negative duty may result from the laws or court decision regardless of whether it is dispute under pu public or private law. On the other hand, for the effective exercise of the right to peaceful enjoyment of property, it is important that the state fulfill a positive obligation, duty meaning, that all measures necessary to protect property rights have been taken. Although there are positive and negative obligations of the state regarding the peaceful enjoyment of property, the European Court often taking into account different specific circumstances of the case, concludes that it is not necessary to categorize its examination and, and to determine whether the imputed situation is connected to the positive or negative obligation of the respondent state. In the case, there is also a special positive obligation of the state regarding enforcement proceedings both against the state and also private debtor. In the cases of the execution of the final court decision rendered against private actors, the state's obligation to execute a judgment as a general rule is limited to providing the necessary assistance of the creditors in enforcing the, enforcing the relevant court judgment and cannot be interpreted uh, of this, uh, compelling the state to substitute itself for a private defendant, even in the case of later insolvency of that, that, of that uh, person. On the contrast, where a judgment is uh, rendered against the states, its bodies, or other entities that do not enjoy sufficient institutional and operational independence from the state, the state must take initiative to enforce the judgment fully and in due time, the state is directly liable for their debts and cannot state that the lack of its own fund as an excuse for the non-enforcement of this decision. This is the court reasoning in the famous group of cases Kachaporen and others, which is rendered against Serbia, and where the court found that Serbian government is directly liable for all debts of the socially owned companies. And I could easily say that this case law uh, marked in some way the case law against Serbia in respect of Article 1, Protocol 1. Now, when we look again, or again uh, at Article 1, the Convention, we can see that there has been has three separate rules on property. This was first, first highlighted in the European Court judgment of Sporong and Lonrot against Sweden. I think that I pronounced it fine. And these three rules, uh, rules explain three different forms of interference with the right to peaceful enjoyment of property. The first rule is of a general nation and it confirms the principle of the right to peaceful enjoyment of property. And this rule in principle is applied when the court cannot apply the second or the third rule. Uh, the second rule defines the deprivation or confiscation of property as a force, form of interference with the peaceful enjoyment of property. And uh, it, uh, in practice of the European Court, this rule is applied in the cases of de facto and de jure expropriation, confiscation, nationalization, and similar. The third rule is also a form of the interference uh, of the exercise of the property right, but this rule does not uh, implies a restriction of the use and the control of the use of property. The control or restriction of property that does, does not imply the transfer of the ownership right rights, the owner keeps the right of ownership, but it is limited to use this property and uh, usually the various tax and foreign exchange measures and penalty, penalties are considered 
to to fall under the rule number three. I would like to highlight that these three rules are not unrelated uh, because the second and third rule refer to certain ways of the interfering with the right to peaceful enjoyment of property. And the first rule is of the general, na uh, general, general nature. And this is the reason why in, in the situation when for the court is difficult to de determine under which uh, rules uh, the situation uh, falls to be examined. The court uh, usually decides that it, uh, such case can be examined within the framework of the general principle and the rule number one. So uh, now uh, I went through the key points of the scope of the property and state duties under Article 1. One, I'm going to move to the question of the assessment of the interference with the, with the right to peaceful enjoyment of property. In other words, how does the court examine the alleged violation of Article 1? When it's assessing whether there has been a violation of Article 1, the European Court assessed the justification of interference um, in the peaceful enjoyment of property, and it is as one kind of a test which, uh, that consists of a series of su uh, su successful phases and successive phases and steps. First question to be answered before the court, the court is there a property right or possession within the meaning of Article 1, or does Article 1 uh, can be applicable in the concrete case, and is there a property ratione materia? The second question to be answered is, are there interference with the property right possession? And under this question, the court can answer, are there a positive or negative obligation of the state, and also under which uh, of these three rules the court will examine the case. The next, next step is, uh, the, as I said, the legal nature of the interference, and in order for the infer interference of the enjoyment of property to be justified, and consequently for the court to find that there is no violation of Article 1, the following conditions must be fulfilled. First, that the interference was uh, under the conditions stipulated by law. Uh, second, that the interference happened due to the existence of a clear legitimate goal established in a general or public interest. And uh, the last, that a fair balance was achieved between the general and public interest of the community and that the protection of the individual's rights to property and that such interference did not impose an excessive or disproportionate burden to the individual. It follows from the content of Article 1 of the Protocol 1 of the Convention that interference with the right to peaceful enjoyment of property must meet the requirement of legality. The interference must be under the conditions by law in accordance with the substantive and procedural rules of domestic law. In principle of the principle, principle of legality implies that the existence of a legal basis for the interference itself is not sufficient to satisfy the principle of legality and that it is necessary for the provision of the domestic law to, to, on the basis of which the interference occurred to be sufficiently accessible, precise and predictable in terms of their application. Now, according to the Article 1 of Protocol 1 to the Convention, interference with peaceful enjoyment of property can be justified only on the condition that is carried out by the public or general, general uh, interest. A legitimate public or general goal must be existing, and it can be from a different sphere of economic, social, cultural, or any other public policies. Regarding these conditions, the states are more or less left with a wide margin of appreciation. I expect that you probably discussed this yesterday under the subject of uh, margin of appreciation. And uh, as a result, the court interpreted this concept of general and public very extensively. And now when we look at the court's case law in respect of European, Central European, Eastern European countries, in the sphere of general and public interests, which represent a justified and sufficient legitimate goal for interference, we can find, among other things, social justice and economic well-being confiscation of legally acquired money, the transition from a communist socialist economy to a free market economy, correction of errors committed by the state's previous regime in the context of Article 1, Protocol 1, implementation of local development plans, as well as protection of creditors. Next step in this test involves assessment of proportionality and whether a fair balance has been established between the general and public interest on the other one hand and individual property, property rights, on the other hand, as well as whether the interference with property rights impose excessive as dis and disproportionate burden to the applicant. 
In assessing the existence of proportionality, the course takes into account several factors. First of all, the assessment of non-existence or existence of adequate procedural guarantees at the domestic level. Second, the choice of measures that were used when interfering with property rights, the assessment whether there were other less invasive measures of interference, uh, then the court can assess whether the applicant acted in good faith, and also important factor is whether the national courts decide on adequate compensation and whether the compensation was paid for the inter interference of property rights. The European Court, through a detailed analysis of these aforementioned factors, and the circumstances of the specific case will establish violation if the court finds that there is a disturbed balance between individual and general interests. Uh, or the court will determine that the interference was justified if, it, if the court established that there is a fair balance between individual and general interests. Now, when I now I'm going to talk about case law in respect of ex-Yugoslavian republics and the Central European countries. And when I prepared myself for this uh, presentation, I went through the key cases of the Central European countries and, and ex-Yugoslavian republics. And I noticed several things. First, that the dominant court's case law in respect of Central European countries and ex-Yugoslav republics are the result of the historical context and the changes that these countries went through. Most of the key cases regarding protection of property rights in respect of these countries are the result of the transition that they went through and transformation from the communist socialist economy to a free, some kind of free market economy. Uh, they are also a result of the corrections of the previously made states, states mistakes regarding unjust convictions and the privation of property, nationalization, and also the finally the case law of these states in respect of Article 1 of Protocol 1 are the result of the dissolution of the states, namely I'm thinking here on Yugoslavia and the war that we went through, and also Czechoslovakia, and the case law against uh, Czech and uh, Slovakia. Uh, in the part where we discussed the Article 1, uh, scope of Article 1, Protocol 1, I already mentioned the important cases of Bronjonski against Poland, Kopetsky against Slovakia, Jentner against Slovakia, Granzinger and Granzinger against Czech Republic, and all these cases were and still are very important for the determination, the determination of, the, of the European Court about the scope of the Article 1, Protocol 1, and the question of jurisdiction of Ratione Materia. I would also like to mention important head case Huten Czapska against Poland and Bito against Slovakia as an important case in and excellent examples of the specifics of Central and Eastern European systems. Uh, and these cases are dealing with the question of, of, uh, of the restrictive system of the rent control uh, originated from the laws that were adopted under the former communist regimes. And we are going maybe to, to go through these cases later if we, if we have enough time. There is no time. Yes? No? <laughs> I already finished. OK. I'm going to, I'm going to try to, to wrap it up. The, the, the cases that I want to discuss is uh, Nesic uh, against Montenegro. It's an important case about the expropriation. Uh, the applicant was the owner of the land. Uh, nevertheless, later, by the law that was adopted by the by the uh, state respondent state, they decided that they will take the land from uh, from the applicant since, since that uh, uh, the land in question was the part of the sea sea land. And the problem with this case was that the uh, respondent state Montenegro were not did not um, uh, did not have the fair and uh, transparent procedure before the domestic courts, and the, finally. The uh, applicant, uh, Mr. Nesic, was not um, compensated for the expropriation that happened. The second uh, important case that I want to discuss is Vaskrasic against Slovenia. This is a very interesting case. Judicial sale of property in the enforcement proceedings. The uh, applicant uh, was a debtor in one uh, enforcement proceedings. That we had three creditors. The first one was Porsche, the second one was, was public supplied company, and the third one was a private person. 
the portion, the private natural person was uh, compensated, but for the debt of 124 euros, the public supply company instituted the enforcement proceeding asking for the house of the, uh, Mr. Vaskris to be sold on the public uh, uh, auction. And the, so the house was estimated for a price of 140,000 euro and it was sold for the half of the price in order to pay a debt of 124 euros. So this is a typical case of disproportionality that exists in some laws. And as a result, in the process of the execution of the judgment, Slovenia had to change the enforcement law and to create some kind of uh, proportionality test that enforce, ju ju judges in the enforcement proceedings can use. The, the next uh, case is Čakarevic against Croatia. It's an interesting case of the confiscation of property due to the mistakes made in the competent state. And another case in this respect is a case of Moscow against Poland. Both these cases regard the social benefits that uh, applicants receive from the state. And uh, as a result of the error that was made by the state authority, they ask in the uh, later procedure for the applicants uh, Čakarević and uh, Moscow to return back the social benefits that they uh, applied. And the court found the violation in both cases because the court found that the applicants in no way contributed to this situation, an error that happened before the national courts and that it is excessive uh, and disproportionate burden for the applicant to, uh, to have to, re to return back to the state uh, all the, the benefits that they received. Uh, because the, the mistake was made by the competent state authorities as in some kind of administrative irregularities. And uh, administrative, administrative confiscation of property, I wanted to discuss about uh, uh, Gabric and Bolivic uh, against Croatia. Uh, both cases are against Croatia, but we have pending case against Serbia. It's called Prancha and others against Serbia. And this is very, for me, it's always interesting because most of us are crossing the borders. and. Usually when, the, when uh, someone asks you, do you have something to declare, and if you say nothing, and they find you 10,000 euros, as a res uh, result of that, uh, the state can confiscate the property. And in these cases, the European court found a violation of Article 1 because they established that there was not a proportionality between the interest to, to prevent the the flu of the money on the borders and the individual burden that the applicants had to, to ha had. And also, because I, I think that we don't have time, but I want to just to, to draw your attention to the important cases about, uh, against uh, Central European countries, Bela Nemet against Hungary. It's an interesting case regarding the possession of property and legal moratorium on eviction. The court didn't find the violation. The applicant could not use its property for two years and because of the moratorium that was uh, prescribed under the national legislation. And the court uh, found that uh, he was not deprived of his possession, that only the, the ownership transfer was delayed for the period of two times. The second case is Skoric Skor 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 against Hungary, and the applicant was not able to, to, to be recognized as the uh, owner of the land uh, from, 90, from uh, period of 1991, when uh, his uh, land was allocated as a mistake of regional office of agriculture, and the court uh, found a violation because the court found that the applicant had to bear a disproportionate and excessive burden. Albert and others against Hungary, it's a grand chamber case, very interesting case. Most of the applicants, they are shareholders of two saving banks. The Hungary adopted a law that changed the influence that they had on the policy of the banks. And this is case which is interesting because it was a grand chamber case that um, the, our colleague, my colleague uh, from Hungary uh, argued very well before the European court and the court found uh, that uh, the application was inadmissible ratione persona because they found that the applicants could not be acclaimed to be a victim of the violation and the court also um, held that the complaints should have been brought by two saving bands and not by the creditors of the, of the applicants. Palka and others against Czech Republic, the, it's about uh, compensation for the confiscated uh, property and the way uh, that uh, correspondent state used the rigid approach and uh, granted only 13% of the market value for the, for the compensation. Hatton, Chapska and Poland and Bito, I already 
Slovakia I already explained, uh, these are the question of the restrictive system of, of the rent control that was uh, that was left after the communist regime with the problems that uh, both countries had. And uh, as a result of these, in, uh, in a very, very detailed analysis of the system in Slovakia and Poland, the, the court found the violation of Article 1, Protocol 1, but in po more importantly, for the court um, uh, used the pilot judgment procedure and uh, triggered the Article 46 and uh, obliged the, the respondent states to adopt some kind of general measures uh, in order to prevent future systematic problems to occur before the court. And finally, Belanen, 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 yes? Yes, how do you say, Be Belanenek, yes, okay. Uh, it's a case uh, that concerns social benefits uh, that were paid to the applicant and Moscow, uh, Moscow against Poland is the case that I already discussed. So uh, to conclude, uh, when you look at these cases, most of them have been decided on two terms. First is um, the scope of the of the right to uh, right to pr protect position, uh, possession or property, and most of the cases that I discussed in the pr first part of the of the presentation were finished finished before the court as ratione materia inco incompatible with the convention. But these cases there and the, the, the previous one they are the example of when the court used the test and mo more of the most of the cases were finished were decided with the violation because the court found that uh, the, that the proportionality was disturbed and that there was not uh, pro proportionality between the general interest and the uh, individual interest. And also, most of these cases, as, as I already mentioned, the result of the pre-transformation process that most of, of Central European and Eastern European and Balkan countries went through, the transition from one uh, type of uh, economy to another and also the result of the law adopted under the previous regime. Thank you.